Bye, guys. How are you guys doing this morning? Good, how are you? Good, thank you. All right, so today um, we're gonna finish up chapter 2.5 and then we're gonna start 2.6. Let me get that in focus here. Um, it's not quite seen in focus, give me a sec. And then um, what I'd like to do is to make sure that we have time. Um, if we have questions on the homework problems or whatever, let's do that at the end, okay? Because we've got to um, stay on schedule with our syllabus here. So um, <clears throat> don't forget that uh, I have office hours today at 12.15 to 1.15. So if you have questions on stuff that we can't get to in class, you're free to come to the office hours. If you want to ask some quick questions before the quiz today, um, you can come to office hours as well. So remember our quiz <clears throat> is going to be, um, the quiz will open up on Canvas at three o'clock today. It'll be open for 24 hours. So it'll start at three o'clock today and it will end at three o'clock tomorrow. Okay, but once you start the quiz, you've got to finish it. Okay, you can't like kind of come back to it and think about it. Um, so you'll have uh, 45 minutes to do the quiz, but that 45 minutes includes 15 minutes of time to download it, take a look at it, print it out if you want to. Um, uh, and then like take a picture when you're done, take a picture and upload it to Canvas. So make sure that you um, give yourself time to do all that stuff. And then um, you have to upload it. Make sure that if you start it, say on Friday, make sure that you um, upload everything and get it in place before three o'clock on Friday. Because if you try to do it after the availability window closes, Canvas won't let you upload it, okay? And, um, and like I said, if anybody has like a DRC accommodation, just contact me offline and then um, we can, We'll work out how the timing is going to work for you. Whew. Okay, so um, and then don't forget your homeworks um, are due on Canvas tonight by midnight. It's 11:59 uh, p.m. Um, is when the uh, official time is. Um, so make sure that you guys get all those homeworks uploaded into our Canvas page um, before midnight tonight. Okay. Okay. All right. So I'm looking at the lecture examples for Chapter 2.5. Um, remember, we're talking about improper integrals. Okay, so this was, um, we're finishing up the part that has to do with when I have an infinite bounds on my integral. Okay, and then we're going to start talking about part two, which is when I have an infinite discontinuity, like a vertical asymptote. But let's do this last example here. So this particular one, right, here's our x-axis, here's our y-axis. We've got, um, this is one half, it kind of comes in, does something like this. The graphs are just for us to visualize. No one's going to grade you on the graphs. Um, that's, I always like to have like kind of a picture. Um, uh, which homework assignments are due by tonight? So the homework assignments, it also says it on our Canvas page. If you look um, on the assignment page, on the module page, as well as on the assignments, it'll tell you what the exact due date is. But um, the, the homeworks that are due tonight are the ones that we're having the quiz on, which is 1.1a, 1.1b, and also 1.3. But all of that, what, what's, um, what's actually being due is, um, it, it'll tell you that on, uh, on Canvas, like what the due dates are, if you look at the assignments. Okay, so um, this is what we're gonna wanna try to do. So remember, the problem with this is, right, the reason it's improper is because our bounds of integration are minus infinity to positive infinity. So how do I calculate an area under a curve, right, if this whole thing goes out to infinity in either direction? So that's why we're converting this to a limit, a limit process. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to break up my integral into two pieces. Um, and I'm going to split it at zero. I don't have a discontinuity at zero, so I can split it at zero. So what I'm going to say is um, minus infinity to zero e to the x, one plus e to the two x dx plus zero to positive infinity, same function. Right, we're going to add that together. So I'm going to take you know, I'm going to do an integral from here to here and then from here to here or, you know, all the way out to infinity. Um, you can choose any number you want. It doesn't have to be zero. Zero is really easy to work with. So I tend to use zero because it's a nice spot. Unless I have a discontinuity at zero, then I'll have to choose a different um, value for that. So um, zero is a nice spot to break things up at. Okay, so um, let's take a look. I'm going to convert these, right? Because I've got now infinite bounds on either side. I'm going to convert these to a limit um, so I can start evaluating that. And then we'll talk about how we're going to actually integrate this. So first off, the limit. So the limit, um, I'm going to go b to minus infinity. So this is going to be b to zero 
e to the x, one plus e to the two x dx, plus the limit. And I'm going to use a different, a different variable here. A goes to positive infinity, zero to a, e to the x, one plus e to the two x dx. Now remember, I could use whatever variable I want. I just chose b and a because whatever. Um, but you can use whatever variable you want there. Okay, just don't use x because you're already using x as your variable. Okay, so we're now converted. You must show this. Everything that I write down here, you must show. Okay, if I write it like in a different color, that's usually like scrap, scrap work. Okay, but this stuff you must show in order to get credit for it. So let's talk about how we're going to do, um, how we're going to integrate this. Um, actually, I'll do it in green. How, how would I integrate um, just offline? Right, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna wanna do, so how do I, how to integrate e to the x, one plus e to the two x dx, right? So let's, this is sort of like our scrap paper, like how we're gonna think about how we're gonna integrate that. So it doesn't seem obvious, but one of the ways that we can do this is um, substitution, right? So if I say u equals e to the x, then my du equals e to the x dx, which I have here, right? And then um, basically what happens is, um, what I'm gonna get is if I substitute in um, e to the x for u, I'm gonna get one over one plus u squared du, right? Because e to the two x is e to the x squared. Remember our laws of exponents, e to the x squared. So this is one plus, one over one plus u squared. So remember this should like kind of ring a bell. This looks like a trig inverse trig function, which is the inverse trig of u, okay? Which now I need to substitute back into being the inverse trig of e to the x, okay? So it's not obvious that this is a substitution problem, right? You're probably wondering like, how am I gonna actually make this work? But it actually comes out being like an inverse trig function. So these are things that you're learning to start to recognize as we go through. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is um, I'm gonna apply the trig in the substitution So you would actually need to show this too. I wrote this in green, but this is something that we would actually need to show work for, okay? So what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna say the limit as b goes to minus infinity. Now this is my antiderivative inverse tangent of e to the x. And I'm gonna evaluate that from b to zero, okay? So we actually do need to show all of this work right here, okay? That's like part of our work showing to get full credit. Plus my other limit, as a goes to positive infinity, I'm gonna go from, oops, sorry, we already integrated that. Um, so this is my antiderivative, sorry. So this is my antiderivative. So I'm gonna go inverse tangent of e to the x, and I'm gonna evaluate that, right, from zero to a, okay? So I've got, you have to show the antiderivative, okay? So, and also, right, you have to carry the limit, this limit process here, you have to carry that on every step that you're doing because that's how you're evaluating this integral, that's how you're gonna evaluate this antiderivative. We're gonna keep up with this limit tag here until um, we actually process that. I'll read your question in just a second. Okay, let me finish this um, train of thought. All right, so let's go ahead. So this is the limit as b goes to minus infinity. Um, now I'm gonna apply this fundamental theorem of calculus. So inverse tangent, of e to the zero minus inverse tangent of e to the b. We're gonna plug that in in just a second. Plus the limit as a goes to infinity, same thing here. Inverse tangent of e to the a minus inverse tangent of e to the zero, okay? Okay. All right, so now let's go ahead and think about this one for a minute. So remember we did our inverse tangents, right? So let's go ahead and plug in what our B is. This is gonna be, this is inverse tangent, e to the zero is one minus the inverse tangent. So e to the minus infinity, this is the inverse tangent of one over e to the infinity, right? So e to the infinity is a huge number, right? Which means that this thing here, goes to zero, <clears throat> so then we have the inverse tangent of zero, okay? So then this one is gonna be, so that's there. So this is plus, we're gonna do the same thing. 
So this is the inverse tangent. Now this is going to positive infinity, so that doesn't flip, minus the inverse tangent, e to the zero is one. Okay, so let's think about what things are. Remember our inverse tangent function. The inverse tangent of one, okay, so that's like where, at what angle is gonna give us a tangent equal to one. That's when the um, angles are equal to each other. That happens at pi over four, okay? The inverse tangent of zero is zero. Plus, let's do this one. So the inverse tangent, this e to the infinity is a really big number, like this is infinity, okay? But remember, this is inverse tangent. So when the inverse tangent heads off to positive infinity, we're hitting that horizontal asymptote. So this is gonna head off to positive two minus, we already did this one, inverse tangent of one is pi over four. Okay, so let's go ahead and process this. So this is gonna be pi over four plus pi over two minus pi over four is pi over four equals pi over two. So what we say, what we conclude from all this is we write the limit exists, therefore the integral converges to, and it's gonna to converge to what our limit exists to, to pi over two. Okay, so that's our final answer. So let me read your question. Um, so you said, can the work be separate from the string of limits we have done the way you did it off to the side? If not, do we need to adjust the bounds? Talking about the use of work. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, um, so <clears throat> there are a couple, I'm gonna, let's see, how can I answer that? I know there are some teachers who, when you do use substitution, um, want to see you readjust the bounds. And that's so when you go to evaluate your antiderivative, you're evaluating it in terms of you. Um, I understand that the bounds of integration um, are, are applying to the variable x and not to the variable u. Um, and so when I, when I do this, when I do use substitution and I have bounds of integration, what I tend to do is I'll take out my bounds um, because even though I know I'm gonna substitute back in for x, I think that there are some um, math instructors when they go to grade it, they get really finicky and they're like, oh, these bounds correspond to x and not to u, so that's wrong. So just take out the bounds when you do the u substitution, integrate it like this. When you substitute it back, then you put back the original bounds. I, I know like there's a whole school of thought about how do you readjust the bounds. Don't worry about that, keep it simple. This is, um, we're integrating, like keep your eyes on the prize, which is that we're integrating with respect to x and ultimately u is just a dummy variable. So I don't need to readjust the bounds and evaluate it with u, okay? I can use my u substitution, integrate it. You can integrate it without bounds. Then in the end, after you substitute it back for x, put your bounds back in, okay? Because the bounds correspond to our variable x, okay? But just to satisfy those people who are upset about like, well, when you readjust, when you use, you use substitution, the bounds correspond to x, leave the bounds off while you're doing this stuff. So all the stuff that I wrote here, see how I took the bounds out when I did it to do the u substitution. But then when I have this, this is my answer. I put it here and I put my bounds back into place for when I'm evaluating it with respect to X. Okay, I know it seems cumbersome, but um, remember we're integrating with respect to X. Okay, <clears throat> so all of this stuff that I wrote down here are things that you need to write down to to get full credit. Let me tell you specifically, when you're doing a problem like this, right? The first thing is, especially for double, um, double improper, we're gonna break it up, right? then I need to specify it's a limit process for each piece of that integral okay, that I broke it up with. I have to show this. I have to show how I'm integrating, right? Because we understand that your calculators will integrate this stuff for you. You have to show us the steps. Okay, as you progress along in the higher level math classes, you can start avoiding some of this stuff because you know, you're showing other work and this is just background work, okay? But right now you have to show your work. Okay, I did substitution. This is how I did it. And this is what I got, right? So now, right, this is our antiderivative. You must show the antiderivative, okay? And because it's an improper integral, we have to show it as a limit process, okay? So I have the limit that sticks along with everything until I actually evaluate it, okay? So I've got the limit I'm plugging in. I'm doing the fundamental theorem of calculus. I'm plugging in, right, what things are. And then I'm gonna evaluate. I'm gonna plug in. So instead of B, it's minus infinity which now what this means is it's e over and one over e to the infinity, which is actually zero. You could, you could have left it like this and said, this part goes to zero. You have to state, we're gonna be looking when we grade this. You have to state that you recognize that this goes to zero, okay? 
you can do each of these steps here. I don't care. You could just leave it like inverse tangent e to the minus infinity, put a little line through it, write a zero here, and then you can write the answer. That's fine. But you have to show us that you're substituting in what your limit is, and you have to show us that you recognize e to the minus infinity goes to zero. Okay. So these are things that we're looking for when we're grading. I'm just trying to give you some feedback based on things that I've seen when we grade as a group the final exam. Um, do we have to show work for simpler substitution integrals? Yeah, at this point um, in the class, in this class, you have to show work for substitution because substitution is one of the um, integration skills that we're teaching this semester. Okay, so in this semester, you have to show work for the even the simpler substitution. I get, um, or you're talking about like when we do like one over x minus three, you should write that you're doing it by um, substitution um, just to keep it happy, keep the graders happy. I think if that's what you're talking about, unless it's like, you know, you're doing the integral of one over x, then you can just you know, write the answer as the ln of absolute value of x. Um, but for everything else, just show the work, okay, in this class, because substitution is one of the skills that we're teaching, okay? So we're gonna wanna see that, you know, you're getting that, okay? All right, so what else, right? You have to be able to evaluate what these things are. I understand if you wanna plug this into your calculator, that's one thing, but we're gonna be looking for answers in terms of pi. Um, often in terms of like our quizzes and our tests and the final exam, we'll say leave your answers in terms of pi, unless you are told specifically otherwise to give things as a decimal. Okay, so make sure that you recognize, you know, how to evaluate this stuff. Okay. Okay, guys. All right, so that's infinite improper integrals. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to, you guys will have this because I'm going to turn the page here. You should be able to, um, I think we're going to finish this um, chapter section off, so I'll scan this in and then upload it later today so you get a chance to see it. Okay, so we talked about what do we do when we have improper integrals and things are, um, the bounds of integration are infinite. Now let's talk about what it means to have an improper integral when I have a, a discontinuity, because this is, a, um, remember at the beginning there were two parts. Part one was the infinite bounds on our integral and the other part was like a a vertical asymptote, some kind of a discontinuity in our function. This is that part right there. So we're gonna call this um, discontinuity at or between our bounds of integration A to B. So I've got, I could have a discontinuity at A or B or somewhere in between those two. Okay, so we're gonna do those, we're gonna talk about those three different conditions. So if our function F our function f is continuous on, watch this, I'm gonna say a is inclusive, but b is not because that's where our in, uh, discontinuity is and has an infinite continuity at b. So we're gonna cover b, then a, then somewhere between a and b. Okay, so what this means is I've got a to b, f of x dx, but b is where I have the discontinuity. That's the part that causes like a divide by zero. Yeah, I know, I think that um, it's okay if you have to log in and out. I'll just, if, if you get bumped out, then just keep trying to come back and then I'll let you in. Um, you know, the, we're kind of beholden to Wi-Fi and, and the internet and stuff. Okay, so now what's gonna happen is, right, we've got this discontinuity at b. So we're approaching our in interval says, I'm gonna go, you can imagine I'm gonna go from a to b, right? So from A to B, so I'm approaching B from the left-hand side, okay, which means my limit is gonna be a left-hand limit. So I'm gonna call this um, C as my dummy variable as I approach B from the left-hand side, okay? So this isn't negative B, this is my limit as this dummy variable C approaches B from the left-hand side because I can't approach it from the right because my functions, I'm not looking at that interval on the right-hand side, I'm just looking from A to B. So all I'm doing is I'm looking at it as I'm heading, you know, to the left, um, towards B. So what I'm gonna do is my integral goes from A to C, F of X DX. So we know we have some kind of discontinuity there. So we're gonna basically try to take the area under the curve as we get close to this, where there would be an infinite discontinuity. Okay, so that's case, that's part one. So the next one is, right, that's if I have a problem at B, let's talk about it if we have a problem at A. So our function F is continuous. on the interval not inclusive a to b, okay? And has an infinite 
discontinuity at A. Okay, so A is now, so we're gonna integrate from A to B, but A is where we have a discontinuity. So I'm gonna be approaching A from the right-hand side. Okay, so that means that if I have my integral from A to B, f of x dx equals, now I'm gonna go the limit as C approaches A from the right-hand side. That's right, this says from the right-hand side. So I'm gonna go from C to B, f of x dx, because I can't include it. I've got a vertical asymptote there, okay? So I wanna be able to get as close as possible to that A value as I possibly can without actually stepping on it. Okay, so these are kind of obvious, right? So mostly we see these infinite discontinuities when I have a rational function, right? And when I look at A to B, I can see that, oh yeah, I can tell right away that A is gonna cause a problem, right? If I plug it into, if I have a rational function, I'm gonna take my, you know, um, take my denominator, set it equal to zero, find out where, what values cause that problem, okay? And then I'm gonna check to see, is that value anywhere along my A to B interval? Um, so this is at B, this is at A. The trickiest part is part number three, which is somewhere in between because it's hidden. Okay, so let's write that. So F is continuous on A to B, right? So it's inclusive, A to B, right? It looks fine. This is the tricky part because you're gonna be lulled into a false sense of like, everything's fine. I can just integrate it normally. You're gonna get a wrong answer. Okay, so it's continuous on A to B, but has an infinite discontinuity at C. And then C is somewhere in between A and B, could be A or B, but we're gonna say it's somewhere in between A and B. Okay, so basically what that looks like is A to B, F of X DX. And how we're gonna do that is we have to split up our integral to go from A to C, plus C to B, and then I have to do a limit. So this is gonna go, um, let's first let's write it out like this. So A to C, F of X DX plus C to B, F of X DX. And now I do a limit, now I do the limits. Right, so now this is gonna be, I'll call it, we'll just choose a different variable, as D approaches C from the left-hand side, A to D f of x dx, see how we're applying each of the ones that we just talked about. And then the limit, I'll choose a different variable. E approaches C from the right-hand side. And this is gonna be E to B, f of x dx. So again, we're talking about, is the integral gonna converge? Okay, so the integral will converge to a value if the limit exists, or this integral will diverge, okay, if the limit doesn't exist. And the same thing here, like we did before, where I've got two limits, right? Because I've had to break it up into pieces. So my integral, my total integral will converge if both parts converge. And it'll converge to, their, to the sum of each of those limits, okay? All right, so three cases, A, B, or somewhere in between. The somewhere in between is the trickiest one because you don't notice it right off the bat. And you have to check. Every time you see a rational function, take the denominator, set it equal to zero, solve for x or whatever the variable is, solve for that variable, find out what values are going to cause a zero in the denominator. Then check to see is that anywhere along your interval. If it's not on your interval, don't sweat it. You're just going to integrate it like normal and evaluate it as, an in, as a definite integral. If you have a discontinuity somewhere along your interval, now you have to handle it like a limit process, okay? All right, so I've got my lecture examples. We're gonna start talking about um, working through with now discontinuities. They aren't, these aren't bounds that are going to infinity. These are where I have vertical asymptotes. I have to be able to think about what that looks like. Okay, <clears throat> I'll let you guys um, finish writing that. And then we'll move on to example number five. <clears throat> Okay, so example number five says, right, same thing. Is it converge or diverge? It, if, it di if it converges, what does it converge to? So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna come up with a quick sketch because I like sketches, right? So I'm gonna go from zero to one. So here's one, here's zero. And then this thing looks like, cuts down, this is a cube root. So we're looking at here, but look, I've got, this is one over the cube root of X, which means I've got, um, 
discontinuity at zero. See, I've put a little dashed line right there at zero, okay? But that's part of my bounds of integration. So, right, I've got my cube root of x, that's a cube root of x equals zero. I solve for x is equal to zero. So when x equals zero, that's gonna give me my discontinuity, which is right here. Okay, so, <clears throat> at x equals zero, which is right there. Okay, so let's think about how we're gonna handle that. So I need to rewrite my integral as a limit. So I'm gonna say b, as I approach b from the right-hand side, right? Because I'm gonna look from zero to one. So I'm only going from here to here, but I wanna, I'm gonna approach this value from the right-hand side there, okay? So now <clears throat> I'm gonna go from b to one, one over the cube root of x dx, which is um, really, x to the minus one third dx, right? The cube root is x to the one third. It's in the denominator, so it gives it a minus, which means I can do the power rule on it, right? So when I do the power rule, what am I gonna get? <clears throat> I'm gonna get the limit as b goes zero to the right. I'm gonna get x to the two thirds, because this is minus one third plus one, which is two thirds all over two thirds, okay? And I'm gonna evaluate that from b to one. So I don't do a plus c anymore because I'm doing a definite integral. So from b to one. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna clean this up when I, the limit as b goes to zero from the right. <clears throat> so I'm gonna get three halves, okay? So this is gonna be, um, oops, sorry. This is gonna be one to the two thirds minus three halves times b to the two thirds. And, and it's okay, uh, this, this should be a one, not an x. Make that more clear. Okay, so one to the two thirds. So I'm plugging in, I'm doing this here, okay? So, right, you're gonna wanna write the sides. Okay, if you wanna factor out the three halves, I don't care, that's fine either way. All right, <clears throat> so when I do this, right, um, now I can plug in my B, I can evaluate my limit. So this is gonna be one to the two thirds is just one, so this is three halves minus, three halves times zero to the two thirds, right? So that's zero, so this is three halves minus zero, which is equal to three halves. So our limit exists, therefore our integral converges and it converges to three halves, right? That's what it, Okay. So we should be able to get things to a point where I can actually plug in my value, see what I've got. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna start smelling up. We're gonna start rolling through different examples here. So this one, right, I've got x cubed. So x cubed equals zero, x equals zero. So I have a discontinuity at x equals zero. So that's right here also, again, in my bounds of integration. Okay, so let's think about it. So this is one over x cubed. This thing kind of looks like, um, it's one of these rational functions, goes like this, but I'm going from zero to two and I've got a discontinuity here. So from zero to two, so I'm looking at coming up with this area, but this thing goes up to infinity, right? So that's part of the problem that we're trying to figure out how we're gonna evaluate that. So zero to two, I've got a discontinuity there. So let's rewrite this. So the limit as B goes to zero from the right-hand side, from B to two, um, I'm gonna rewrite this as X to the minus three DX. Okay. Cause it's in the denominator. So I just bring it up, I can do the power rule on this, which is gonna look like the limit as B goes to zero from the right-hand side. So the power rule says, I'm gonna increase this by one. So this is, x to the minus two, and I'm gonna divide by minus two. <clears throat> and I'm gonna evaluate this from b to two. Okay. You must show the antiderivative. You must show this step here where we're converting it to a limit, and you must show the antiderivative before we start to process it. Okay, so let's go ahead and start working that through. So the limit as b goes zero to the right. So this is gonna be um, minus one half. This is one over, 
two squared, I'm gonna plug this in, minus, minus one half, one over b squared. Okay, but b is going to zero. Okay, which is gonna give me one over zero squared. Okay, this here makes our limit not exist. Okay, this is an unbounded limit. Okay, limit does not exist. Therefore, our integral diverges. Okay. I don't have to say what the integral diverges to. Okay, it's just that the integral diverges. Okay. Because it doesn't matter. It's going to diverge to, you know, something infinite. Okay. <clears throat> this stuff is optional, that's optional, except this is going to help you, right, recognize where your discontinuity is. You don't have to do a graph at all. That's just, I like to do a graph because I like to think about it, right? I recognize I have a discontinuity here. Okay, I have to work it through it. You have to convert your integral to a limit first, and then you have to have the limit in your antiderivative. Then you need your limit here while you're starting to evaluate. Then you have to say what this is going to evaluate to, one over zero squared, that's bad, that's a divide by zero error, which means that our, our conclusion is our limit does not exist, therefore the integral diverges, okay? I guess I'll turn the page. All right, let's take a look again. So this is one over x cubed again, and we're gonna go from minus one to positive two. So um, remember, um, x cubed equals zero, x equals zero is where we have a discontinuity, right? But look, I'm going from minus one to positive two. Remember we drew this graph. So it looks like this. Like this, I've got a, a discontinuity at zero, but I'm gonna go from minus one to positive two. So this is the area that I'm looking at. Okay, but I've got this discontinuity in the middle. If I'm not careful and I don't check where that discontinuity is, I'm gonna plow right through. I'm gonna integrate with the power rule. I'm gonna get a bogus answer. <laughs> it's gonna look correct because it'll be a real answer, but I'm, I'm ignoring that discontinuity in the middle. So make sure you're always checking where your discontinuity is. Okay, <clears throat> all right, so let's check. So let's write at the top, we have an interior discontinuity. Okay. All right, so we checked, we figured out where it is. So now what that means is I have to break up my integral. So I'm gonna go from minus one to zero, x to the minus three dx plus, I'm gonna go from zero to two, x to the minus three dx. I converted it you know, to a power like that so I can start to get ready. Now I'm gonna convert this into a limit. So this is gonna be the limit as a goes to zero from the left, minus one to a, x to the minus three dx plus the limit as b goes to zero from the right, b to two, x to the minus three dx. Okay, so first we broke apart our integral, now I converted each one into a limit, okay? All right, <clears throat> so I'm gonna use the work, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cheat, so work from before, in terms of like how I actually integrated that. So then basically what I'm looking at is um, I've got the limit, as a goes to zero from the bottom, I've got minus one half x to the minus two minus one to a plus limit as b goes zero there, minus one half x to the minus two, b to two. And now basically what happens is I've got minus one over two to the zero, a zero squared plus, this, this is minus minus one over two to the minus one squared, right? This is the problem we're having a problem with. I'll write it all out, even though already I can see this is gonna bomb it out. But this one here, we're gonna get minus one um, over two, two squared uh, minus one over two b squared. This is gonna be a zero again squared. So these do not exist. Right, this is a bomb out, so limit does not exist. Therefore, our whole integral diverges. 
So <clears throat> let me just say, if you start to work it through and you do this part and you see this, okay, you can stop. You can say, this is gonna cause the limit to not exist. Therefore, the integral is gonna diverge. You don't even have to continue because once one part of the limit diverges, once one part of the limit doesn't exist, the whole thing's gonna bomb out, okay? I can't have infinity plus one eighth and then expect that to be a, a real number, okay? So once you get here, then you're done. <clears throat> okay, give you guys a chance to finish writing that and we'll do our last example. So this one is a double, a double um, improper, right? So I've got my um, discontinuity. So radical x equals zero. So x is equal to zero. X plus one equals zero. X is equal to minus one. So I've got discontinuities at x equals zero and x equals minus one. Okay, but look at what's happening. From zero, I don't, don't have to worry about minus one because that's outside the bounds of my integration, but zero hits, hits exactly where I have one of my discontinuities. So I have a discontinuity here and I'm going to infinity. So I've got to like process this in you know both ways in terms of my improper integral. Okay, so basically um, what we're gonna do is, <clears throat> our process is we're gonna break up the integral into pieces, okay? And we're gonna break it at a convenient point. Okay, so what do I mean, my, I, what do I mean by that? Now I need to do two different limits because I have to evaluate as I go to zero, right? From the, uh, le uh, from the right hand side. And I also have to evaluate as my value goes to infinity. So I need two different integrals in order to handle that. So I'm going to break this up. So I'm going to go from zero. I'm just going to choose. I don't have any other discontinuities inside of it. So I'll just choose one. It doesn't matter. Um, radical x, x plus one dx plus, and then I'm going to go from one to infinity, one over radical x, x plus one dx. It doesn't matter what value you choose. One's really simple, right? going to make my evaluation of radical x, you know, when I go to do the antiderivative, it's going to make it easy. So <clears throat> you can choose any value you want when you break this up. Um, but just make sure that you're choosing something that's not going to create like, a lot of headache for yourself. Okay. So like if I chose zero to 100,000, well, now I've got to evaluate that. So it's going to be a pain. So think about like, you know, what you're going to get. Okay, so zero to one and then one to infinity. Now I'm gonna do limits, right? Cause I've got a discontinuity here and I've got an infinite bounds there. So I'm gonna say the limit as B goes to zero from the right hand side, I'm gonna integrate from B to one, one over radical X, X plus one dx plus, and I'm gonna make this a limit as A goes to infinity, one to A, radical X, X plus one dx. Okay. <clears throat> okay. I, I'm gonna skip, I'm gonna let you guys do the antiderivative. I'm gonna let you guys do the actual integration um, stuff on here, but basically, um, I'm, so I'm just gonna give you the antiderivative. So this is gonna be limit as B goes from zero to the um, right, two times the tangent minus inverse tangent radical X. Um, you can think about that. So like if you multiplied this through, what would you get? And, and that would actually fill out into a, um, an inverse tangent form. Um, B to one plus the limit, it goes to infinity. <clears throat> okay. And now I can actually evaluate this. This is gonna be two times. This is gonna go, um, I'm skipping some parts here just to show you, cause I wanted to, the important piece was, how was I gonna break this up here? Pi over four minus zero plus two times pi over two minus pi over four, which is equal to pi. So we say the limit exists, therefore converges to pi. And I'll just make a little note that I skipped 
steps and I skipped steps just to be just to get to the point where I showed you how we broke it up and what the limit was like how we broke this up as a two different pieces okay I'll let you guys work these offline and then if you want you can come to office hours and we can talk about it in more detail okay but our limit our limit exists so therefore our interval converges to that limit value okay All right <clears throat> So that ends chapter 2.5 and um, I will scan that in and then upload that to you guys later so that you'll have that um, for a reference when I put that on the Canvas page later. You guys all done writing this part? Okay. Okay, so We've been talking about, like I said, different techniques for integration, right? Chapter 1.1 was integration by substitution, integration by parts, okay? Um, chapter 1.3 was integration by partial fractions. Okay, how do we, when do we know when we're gonna do that? Um, chapter 2.5 was um, taking a look at improper integrals. So we're trying to figure out when I go to integrate something and it's got these weird bounds or discontinuities, how do I handle that, okay? So chapter 2.6, is another tool. It seems like we're going backwards. Like I'm going back to like Calc 1 or something like that. How come I'm gonna do? This is called numerical methods, numerical techniques. Is that, make sure that it's totally in focus here. Okay, so <clears throat> numerical techniques are important because often we're gonna get um, functions that are really complex and, um, and I can't integrate, I can't use substitution parts, or I can't use, you know, I, I can't use anything, any tool that we've learned so far. So I need to actually have a numerical technique that's gonna allow me to come up with an approximation for what the integral actually is. <coughs> Your calculator, as a matter of fact, uses one of these numerical techniques to calculate the integrals, okay? So we're gonna um, talk about what these numerical techniques are. You probably learned some of them, like the midpoint, approximation, trapezoidal, maybe even Simpsons, when you were learning, um, when you first started to learn Riemann sums, when you started to learn about integration as a whole. So these are um, similar to, um, basically they're just different techniques for doing Riemann sums. Um, only we're gonna use n values, we're gonna break this up into chunks, right, that are, you know, doable, so I can do it in a sitting, okay? When you, when you do this homework, um, Keep in mind, give yourself plenty of time to do this homework. Homework isn't hard. It's just gonna take a long time to do it because you've got all these different end values and all these little calculations you have to do. So give yourself time to do it. Okay, so let's start off with, I've got my function f of x and I'm gonna come up with a graph, just a, you know, a generic graph. So here's my x, here's my y, and my function does this. Here's my f of x. Okay, so now what's gonna happen is, um, I'm gonna break up my function. I wanna be able to integrate, come up with an area under the curve between a couple of values, right? <clears throat> so I wanna say from A to B, you know, what's my function actually doing, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break this up into chunks and I'm gonna take the area of those chunks and I'm gonna sum up those areas. Okay, so the three different ways that we're gonna talk about is these numerical te techniques are the midpoint approximation, the other one is called the trapezoid rule. Where we break this midpoint breaks it up into rectangles. Trapezoid rule breaks it up into trapezoids. And then Simpson's rule actually uses parabolas to come up with an approximation for the area under the curve. Okay. So let's talk about first um, our midpoint approximation. So I'm going to put up what the formulas are for each one, like draw out a picture, put up the formula, and then we're gonna roll through an example. Um, <clears throat> and then we're gonna do each of those different types. So we're gonna talk about like, how many boxes am I doing? Or how many trapezoids am I doing? Um, and how does that make my approximation better? All right, so the midpoint means, right, I've got, I'm gonna draw rectangles, but I'm gonna break this up. So depending on, um, actually, let's write this out. So when I do this, I've got some kind of interval my interval from A to B is subdivided into N sub intervals 
of equal length. We call this that subintervals each a delta x is going to be b minus a over n. Okay, so this is like our width, right? The width of our rectangle, or equal length. So now um, what I'm going to do is I've got, I'm going to go from here to here to here. So my midpoint says in between, this is like a, a delta x right here. The midpoint in between these two is the point at which it's going to hit the curve. When you did Riemann sums, you probably did like left, right, and midpoint approximation. I'm going to try to over exaggerate this. This curve isn't so curvy. Okay, so the midpoint, right, is the, it's not this side or that side, it's in between these two. So I have to basically take the average of this point and this point and take that average. So this is, we'll call this, we're going to go from x naught x1, x2, x3, x4, for example, okay? So then my first midpoint is gonna be x0 plus x1 divided by two to get this point right there. This is the height of my rectangle. This is the width, right? So if the area of my rectangle is gonna be base times height, right? So this width times height, it's gonna give me the area. I'm gonna add up all the areas of all these rectangles and that's gonna give me an approximation of the area under the curve between A and B. Okay, that's our basically our goal. Okay, so let's talk about the midpoint. What's our formula for the midpoint? So if I'm integrating from A to B, my function f of x dx, and I want to represent it with a midpoint approximation, <clears throat> it's going to be delta x, this is our width, times the function itself evaluated at my first midpoint plus the function evaluated at, oops, x2 divided by two. Right here, my second midpoint, see x1 plus x2 divided by two, plus the function evaluated at x2 plus x3 divided by two, and so on and so forth, right? So I can keep going, and so on and so forth for how many ends that we have, okay? This is, you know, just this particular case, right? We're gonna have one, two, three, four, n equals four, so this is n equals four, for example, okay? So now, um, n is gonna specify the number of subintervals. Oh, uh, yeah, there we go, n subintervals. Okay, so we're gonna keep filling this out until we fill out all the rest of our subintervals. Okay, so this is midpoint. You probably saw this when you did the Riemann sums. So let's talk about, um, I'll put up the, the other two rules. So the trapezoidal rule, Trapezoidal rule, trapezoid rule, depending on how things go. Um, all right, so let's draw a picture. So it's gonna look like, just so we have a visual. Here's our function. So now we're gonna go from A to B. Here's X naught, X one. So we've got N sub intervals, say for example. Now my trapezoid, right, is gonna be this shape right here. So here's my first trapezoid, right? My second trapezoid is gonna be from here to here. It's gonna go from there to there. And then here's another trapezoid. It's hard to see these. This isn't quite so curvy, but there are different trapezoids in there. So this is X1, X2, X3, X4. That's a three. So one, two, three, four. This is one, two, three, four. This is N equals four again, just to have a visual, okay? So <clears throat> our trapezoidal rule, when I, go, when I go to integrate, this is gonna look like Say I'm integrating my function f of x dx. And you guys always have a question like this on the final exam. There's always something, and it's usually a function that I can't easily integrate, okay, using, um, using any of the tools that we have. Okay, so now the trapezoidal rule says I've got my delta x divided by two. I'll talk about why we're doing that in a minute. Um, so now I'm gonna evaluate f of x naught plus two f of x one plus two f of x2 plus two f of x3 plus f of x4. Okay, the coefficients, let's write this down. I'll do that in green. Coefficients follow the form 
one, two, 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 so on and so forth. And then the last one has to be one. Okay, so one on either end and then twos in between. And that comes from like the area of the trapezoid. Um, right, it's the basically the average of the bases times the height, right? So base one plus base two divided by two times the height. Okay, so we're trying to mimic that here. Okay, that's where we have the over two. And then this comes from how am I gonna handle, you know, the two different bases. And then if I were to distribute this out, what am I getting? Okay, so think about the area of your trapezoid, right? So I'm adding up the areas of all these little trapezoids. Our third rule is called Simpson's rule. This is one that your calculator uses. And what happens is I've got my function, say for example, f of x, and then um, Right, so I'm going to go from A to B. And then basically what happens is I'm looking at from here to here. And I'm going to be using like parabolas to help me figure this out. It doesn't seem like it's going to work really well, but it's like, um, actually, it probably would have been better if I'd done parabola this way. You can imagine a parabola this way. And then a parabola this way to approximate the shape of that curve. OK, so we're using parabolas. Okay, with Simpson's rule, n must be an even number. Okay, n must be even. You can't do n equals five. It must be n equals four or two or some other even number. Okay, so our Simpson's rule approximation says <clears throat> I'm integrating my function from a to b. I need the a to b. I need the bounds on the integral because how else am I going to calculate my width, my delta x? Okay. It's going to be approximately equal to delta x over three because I need how many points do I need to create a parabola? I need three points to create a parabola. f of x naught plus four f of x one plus two f of x two plus four f of x three plus f of x four. And we're going to talk about what these are. So. <clears throat> The coefficients um, are like one, four, two, four, two, four. The last one has to be four and then a one. So I go one to one, right? And then I alternate four, two, four, two, four. And then one. The, the second to last one has to be a four and then a one, okay? In terms of your coefficients, that's different than our trapezoid, which is one on either end and then twos in between. This one is one on either end, and then four, two, four, two, four, one. Or it could be four, two, four, two, four, two, four, two, four, one. Okay, but it has to be one, four, and then you're alternating. Right? <clears throat> Phew. So these rules here. Okay. Then we're going to start applying them to um, different examples. Well, we're going to start working through this and then um, we'll probably have to finish it on Monday. Okay. You guys, I'll have that. I'll give you a second to finish writing it. So looking at the lecture examples for chapter 2.6. Um, the first question, one over x squared, we can just integrate using the power rule. The second example, which I goofed up and I called example one again, but it's really example two. Um, that's actually a final exam question um, from you know a couple of years. This one gets recycled a lot as a final exam question. E to the minus x squared dx. I can't integrate that using any of the techniques that we have so far. So I have to use one of the numerical methods or I have to use stuff that we're gonna learn later like in chapter four, which is the polynomial approximation for functions um, in order to integrate that. <clears throat> so remember, we're learning in this class all these different techniques and tools for evaluating functions. Okay, so part of what we're trying to do is like a checklist of what kind of function type is this and what kind of tool do I need to evaluate that? Okay, all right, so the first thing we've got is um, we've got this integral of one over x squared dx and for n equals four, we're gonna compare this. This one, we can calculate the integral directly. So we're gonna um, come up with that value. So we can use that in our minds to compare, 
you know, um, is our approximation close to the actual value or what? So um, what I'm going to do when I first do this is, so I'm going to write this one to two, I'm going to write this as x to the minus two dx, and I can do the power rule on that. So when I go to integrate this, what am I going to get? I'm going to get minus one over x from one to two, which is going to be minus one over two minus a minus one over one. <clears throat> so this is minus one half plus one, which is equal to one half. Okay, so just like doing a direct integration, just to kind of see, we're going to compare our answers to this one here. Okay. So um, let's talk about, uh, I'm going to do a little prefetching here. My n is equal to four. So my delta x, I'm going to go b minus a all over n. So I'm going to say um, b, right? So this is two minus one all over four. So this is one fourth. Okay. So that gives me a little bit of um, prefetch stuff. So now <clears throat> I'm gonna um, just calculate out what my um, x naught, x1, x2, x3, x4 values are gonna be. Um, so I know I'm gonna go from one to two and I need to increment by quarter increments at, at a time. So if x naught is equal to one, that's equal to my a. x1 is equal to um, one plus my delta x, which is one plus one fourth, that's five fourths x2 is equal to this one, right? I'm going to start at that one. So it's going to be 5 fourths plus 1 fourth, which is 6 fourths. I'm going to leave it as 6 fourths. You can simplify it if you want to. It doesn't matter. Um, actually, I'm doing this out because I'm going to need all these, these values here and the rest of it. So just kind of doing this ahead of time kind of helps me prefetch the work. So this is going to be um, 6 fourths plus 1 fourth. That's equal to um, 7 fourths. And then x4, 7 fourth plus 1 fourth is 8 fourths, which is equal to 2. This is my b value. Okay, your first and your last should be b, a and b, so that um, that's a good reality check that you add these up. Okay. Um, can you say one more time where these numbers are coming from? Which numbers are we talking about? Um, this number right here or these numbers here? the work, this stuff right here. Okay, so where, what am I doing? Yeah, so that's a great question. So let's think about it. So I've got, so the question is where are these numbers coming from and why, why am I doing all this stuff here? So this is like all of the work that I need for, for the rest of my, my stuff. So <clears throat> let's go back to here. Okay, so <clears throat> let's pretend this isn't our, our, our graph, but let's pretend this is our graph, right? I'm gonna break this up into, um, we're told n equals four. So I have to do this into four sub intervals. So that means I need a delta x. So each of these, the midpoint is using rectangles. So these have four rectangles. We were told to use four. So that's why, because it says at the beginning n equals four. So I'm gonna break it up into four sub intervals. They have to be of equal width, which means they're gonna be from the end minus the beginning divided by the number of sub intervals. So I go, two minus one all over four gives me, these all have width equal width of one fourth. So one fourth, one fourth, one fourth is my width. I'm gonna start at one, right? Cause my bounds of integration are from one to two. So I'm gonna start at one. I'm gonna add one fourth to find out what's this here. So one plus one fourth is um, <clears throat> five fourths. And then five fourths plus one fourth puts me here, which is six fourths. 6 fourth plus 1 fourth puts me here, that's 7 fourth. So I'm calculating out these bounds here on either, like the boundaries on each of my rectangles because I'm going to use them in my midpoint trapezoidal and Simpson's rule. So I just like got them ahead of time. So I saved myself from having to think about what's the formula and what are my delta x's and what are my x values. Let's do it out and then you'll see how things are going to come into play. So remember, um, <clears throat> we would say one to two, one over x squared dx is approximately equal to, let's plug this in. Our midpoint formula says delta x times f of x naught plus x one all over two plus f of x one plus x two all over two plus f of x two plus x three all over two plus f of x three plus x four all over two. Right, this is a midpoint. So I'm looking for this with plus this divided by two gives me this value. I'm gonna plug that into my function to get the height of my rectangle. I want the midpoint of my rectangle. So I have to 
you know, figure out the beginning, the end of the rectangle, what's the midpoint. So I'm going to do those here. So <clears throat> this is going to be, I'm going to start plugging things in. So my delta x is one fourth. F of, let's do, we're going to do f of first, and then we're going to actually plug it into our function. So we're, I'm going to really belabor this point as we go first, OK? Um, so f of x naught plus x1. So this is going to be 1 plus 5 fourths divided by 2 plus f of x1 plus x2, 5 fourths plus 6 fourths divided by 2. Now I'm glad I didn't simplify it. Plus f of <coughs> x2 plus x3 divided by 2 plus f of x3 plus x4, 7 fourths plus, I'm going to call this 8 fourths divided by two, that's my function. I'm gonna plug those values into my function, right? So one plus five fourths divided by two, I'm just gonna write it down here. This is nine eighths. This one, when I do it out, this is um, 11 eighths. This is 13 eighths and this is 15 eighths. So these are the values F of nine eighths, right? That's what I'm gonna plug in. So my function is one over X squared. So watch what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna plug this into, 1 over 9 eighths squared. So 1 over x squared. You, you have to, I, I see a lot of people, they, they make this mistake. They go f of this, and then they just add these values up. These are just index values. These are values that I'm plugging into my function. So watch, I'm plugging into my function now. Plus 1 over 11 eighths squared plus 1 over 13 eighths squared plus 1 over 15 eighths squared. Okay. And then just plug it into your calculator. Um, then don't forget to divide by four, multiply by one fourth. And then um, this is your approximation for this integral. <clears throat> all right, so be careful when you plug this in because if you try to do this all in the long stream, <laughs> sometimes your calculator, you lose track of numbers and stuff like that. So I, I tend to do each one individually and then add them all up just so I don't lose track. So when I did this out, I got 0 0.4955. Four seven nine three six five. Why am I going so far out? On the on an exam, you'd only need to go out like four points, but we're going to go far out so we can start to see what the error is as we go farther out. Okay. Um, all right. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stop here. So we have um, because uh, we're getting close on time, I won't be able to go very far in the trapezoidal rule anyway. Um, and then we'll pick this up. We'll finish this on Monday. And then, then on Monday, we'll pick up the next chapter section too. So we'll wrap up this, the examples here, and then we'll do it on um, Monday. Um, we've got like three minutes. Uh, does uh, anybody have a question they wanna ask really quick? You have three minutes, you pretty much only get one question. <clears throat> or you can come to office hours if you want. I posted a solution to the homework problems yesterday if you guys wanna um, take a look at those. Otherwise, you're free to go if you guys don't um, have a question. What sections are on the quiz? So on the quiz, if you want, if you're not sure, if you can't remember, take a look at our Canvas page. Right at the bottom, it says quiz, and it'll say what chapter sections. I'll tell you, it's 1.1 A, B, the two sections of 1.1 and 1.3, but I'm, I'm posting it onto um, the Canvas page. Yeah, so, um, so 1.3, uh, question 14, you know, actually, I think I posted that to our Canvas page. So um, why don't you take a look there? Um, so that you can get a chance to see what that looks like, okay? Um, if you still have a problem or questions on what I wrote on that solution um, for 1.3 question 14, either send me an email or come to office hours and we can go through that, okay? Okay, guys, all right, good luck. Don't forget, homeworks are due tonight and the quiz is gonna open up at three o'clock today. You'll have 24 hours to start it, right? But once you start it, you have to finish it, okay? Have a great weekend. You too. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Professor. Bye, take care.